right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our Innovations in Tobacco Control Lecture Series. I'm Joanna Cohn, uh, Director of the Institute for Global Tobacco Control, and you are really in for a treat today. Um, I've heard Jennifer Fang speak before on this topic, and it is so intriguing, so exciting, and so important. So let me just... Um, give you a very brief introduction about Jennifer. So she actually has a lot of international experience, both personally and when it comes to work. Uh, so she was born in China, spent a number of years in Russia and speaks Russian. She went to um, do her bachelor's degree in, in nutritional sciences at um, in Vancouver at the University of, University of British Columbia. Um, she ended up uh, doing her MPH at the University of Liverpool in England and then worked um, in between as a project coordinator at Peking, um, at the Institute for Global Health at Peking University. Um, she did a, a couple months at, at the Ministry of Health in China, um, in Beijing as well. And so currently, she is a project coordinator um, and research fellow for the Global Tobacco Control Project at Simon Fraser University in British Columbia, Canada. Um, and she's going to talk to us about the China National Tobacco Corporation. And just, I think many of you know this, but uh, it bears repeating that there are more cigarettes consumed in China than the next top 29 consuming countries all combined. Okay, so if we're gonna do something about death and disease caused by tobacco products in the world, we cannot ignore China. We're not gonna make progress without focusing on China. And we also know that the tobacco industry is the prime driver of these epidemics. So it's so important to understand um, what the China National Tobacco uh, Corporation is doing, how they're operating, and what their strategies are. So um, I, I'm very excited to hear this, and, and as I said, I know you're in for a treat. So thank you very much for being here, Jennifer. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Joanna, and uh, thank you to you guys for coming out. Um, my name is Jennifer. I'm based at the Faculty of Health Sciences at the Simon Fraser University, and uh, we are a um, research program, Global Tobacco Control Research Program, and we are an international collabor collaboration with uh, collaborators in the UK, Australia, and here in the States. Uh, we receive funding from a range of sources, including the U.S. National Institutes of Health, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, and the Social Sciences and the Humanities Research Council of Canada. We look at the um, supply side of things. So we look at the tobacco industry behavior, and we study how they adapted to globalization and how they market their products. Um, we are mostly social scientists, so our research tends to be more uh, qualitative than quantitative. And you know, we here are some examples of the work we've done. Uh, there's the pa there's a series of papers that looked at the emerging what we call emerging transnational companies. Uh, we also looked at how the tobacco industry funds various causes such as HIV AIDS to deflect attention from themselves and to clean up their uh, public image and reputation. And just late last year, we had a couple of papers come out on Paraguay, which looked at its role in illicit trade, and it actually implicated their former uh, president. Apart from uh, research, we also engage with the media. So um, late last year, The Guardian did a piece uh, that looked at the tobacco industry funding of think tanks that was based on some of the work we've produced. So it looked at how tobacco industry has funded these third party think tanks, which then put out their, what they will say is their independent research, but is actually funded by the tobacco companies. Uh, and a few weeks ago, I was uh, interviewed for this paper in the Financial Times, which looked at China Tobacco's uh, global expansion strategies. And being such an international team, we do have a range of 
language abilities, which is very helpful in terms of uh, dissemination. So last summer, there were quite a few articles come out on uh, various Chinese media, and this is a website that's popular among the expat community um, just around the world. It looked at online sales of Chinese cigarettes, specifically in Vancouver. Uh, this is a big problem in Vancouver and uh, Toronto, which have large Chinese populations. And again, late, late last year, we had some, uh, a series of news articles come out in ABC Color, again on the Paraguay uh, papers. So my role within the uh, research program is mostly looking at Asian tobacco com uh, companies and specifically the China National Tobacco Corporation. So why do I look at this company, obscure company that probably not many people outside of China have even heard about? You know, most uh, academic research on the industry is looking at the usual suspects, such as British American Tobacco or Philip Morris International. Well, I think this map gives you an idea of why CNTC is such an important player. So I hope you can see it clearly, but we're looking at the red dots, and those represent the cigarette factories around the world. So here, here, uh, here's China, and then there are five major companies producing cigarettes. So there are a total of 10 um, major Cigarettes, sorry, this map shows a total of 10 cigarette producing uh, factors in the world, and five of those are in China, right? So half of the top 10 largest cigarette factors in the world are found in China, operated by this one big giant umbrella organization. Well, if CNTC is mostly domestic, and these companies are found in China. Why should any one of us outside of China care? Here's why. Map of the world. Um, again, you can see the head, sorry, I lost my pointer. The, right there is the headquarters of CNTC, and all of the other pins represent where CNTC is operating offshore facilities. So that is Southeast Asia. That's Africa, that's Middle East, Europe, South America, and even here in the United States. I'll come back to this map later, but I just wanted to show it for a visual impact at first. So let's backtrack and look at the history of tobacco in China. Now, nobody knows for sure, but it's thought that um, the tobacco leaf, the tobacco as a plant was first brought into the country in the uh, 15th, sorry, 16th century by trading merchants. And then by the mid 19th century, tobacco cultivation was already established in the various parts of the country. So smoking remained a luxury then until the late 19th century after the American inventor James Bonsack invented the first uh, automated machine, uh, cigarette rolling machine which contributed to uh, an increase in production capacity and more people were able to smoke. In the first half of the 20th century, the, Chinese, uh, the tobacco industry in China was dominated by British American tobacco, who enjoyed 82% market share. The remaining 18% were uh, by the smaller local manufacturers, the most prominent of which were the Nanyang brothers. Business was good, but communists came to power in 1949, and British American tobacco was forced to leave in 1953 because the industry was nationalized. Just because they left does not mean all the addicted Chinese smokers magically stopped smoking. What happened was many, many local smaller factories came up and started producing this very profitable commodity to, for the Chinese smokers. The government realized how profitable this was, and they, they established the China Tobacco Industrial Corporation in 1963 for centralized management uh, and production, as well as for um, revenue purposes. 
this is when tobacco production in China went up rapidly. And it kept going up until 1966. But in 1966, the Cultural Revolution started and the China Tobacco Industrial Corporation was dismantled. That let the industry revert back to its former very fragmented and chaotic state. And it stayed that way for the next decade or so. The government made a second attempt at uh, nationalizing production and uh, management in 1981, which is when China National Tobacco Corporation was officially formed. And it was formed as a state-owned monopoly, which was formalized in 1983 when State Tobacco Monopoly Administration was established. So now, 40 years later, still going strong. It's still a state-owned monopoly, and it produces 2.5 trillion cigarettes every year. I can't even tell you off the top of my head how many zeros there are in a trillion, but far too many. They account for 43% of the global output, right? So that means that four out of every 10 cigarettes produced globally are brands owned by this one company. They are a major revenue generator, to the central government, and they account for 7 to 11 percent central government revenue every year. Traditionally, it's been hovering about at around 7 percent, but it has spiked to as high as 11 percent in some years. I believe the latest numbers are 6 point something, so not very far from 7 percent. Their revenues are greater than that of BAT, PMI, and Altria combined. So this is a company that's far larger in scale than any of the transnational comp tobacco companies that we usually look, are familiar with. Um, in terms of size, they employ half a million people across the country. So they are big in every manner. The industry is part of the government. So at the top level, you have the uh, headquarters, China National Tobacco Corporation, as well as the State Tobacco Monopoly Administration. So they are based in um, Beijing. And they manage the provincial tobacco companies slash monopoly offices at the provincial level. So in theory, CNTC and STMA are supposed to be two separate entities, with CNTC being the commercial arm, so they produce and market cigarettes, and the STMA being their uh, regulatory uh, arm that administers the monopoly as well as regulates the industry. However, in practice, it's the same office, it's the same leadership. So because it's more, it's almost like a, any other government sector, this mimics the government sector setup. Right, so you have at the central level, provincial level, municipal level, and the county level. So this mimics the uh, top down, the, the vertical bureaucracy of any government sectors. You know, the, uh, the Ministry of Health operates the same way. There's a ministry at the central level, there's the health bureaus at the provincial level, et cetera, et cetera. So that is the um, administrative side of things. On the production side, there are provincial industrial companies. Now, these companies do not actually produce anything themselves. They manage the tobacco factories that are found within their provinces. So that would be equival the equivalent of, you know, uh, Maryland industrial company managing a uh, Baltimore cigarette factory. As well as factories, the industrial companies also uh, manage marketing centers and various factories producing uh, anything else you need to make a cigarette. So that's paper, that's filters and machinery. So that's the basic setup of the industry within China. Now, this is a huge organization that has a lot of agency power. The power can be exhibited in three ways. Number one, they have great political power because they are part of the government and therefore they are able to engage directly in any tobacco-related uh, discussions. They will be present at 
around at the table, you know, even if they're talking about tobacco control legislation. This is a book that was published, uh, I guess, almost a t ten, 10 years ago, and it's called uh, Countermeasures to WHO Frame Convention on Tobacco Control. It was developed by, the, by a working group of the tobacco industry, and the whole point was to minimize impact of WHO FCTC on the survival of the industry. This is a book you can buy in China still. So that's an exhibition, a um, way to illustrate their political power. Secondly, the industry uh, has a lot of financial power because they are a major revenue generator. To the central government, it's an average of 7% every year, but in heavily tobacco dependent areas, for example, Yunnan province, the numbers can be as high as 70%. One industry, over 70% of their provincial revenue. And thirdly, they have ideational power. They normalize smoking and tobacco use through a range of their activities. If you are familiar with the Chinese culture, um, here in the middle is double happiness sign, traditionally associated with weddings. This brand was initially created as um, a cigarette brand to be distributed at weddings because providing cigarettes in China is seen or is rather being framed by the industry as uh, being a good host. So because you want to be a good host, you have to accommodate any of your guests who are maybe smokers. And this is still very true today. Uh, just two years ago, I was bridesmaid uh, for a friend who had her wedding in China. I was asked to stand at the venue door with the, um, with, the, with the newlyweds to greet their guests while holding a tray of cigarettes. So this is still very true today. I mean, it could be because uh, that region did not have any public smoking bans, so you could still smoke in a hotel. But um, I know in other cities, smoke-free weddings are becoming more and more common, especially if the uh, city also has a public smoking ban. So you know, even if you can grab a cigarette, you won't be able to smoke it. So that's kind of pointless. And then the uh, other way that the industry has normalized smoking is through its various corporate social responsibility project, projects. This is a photo I took directly from a uh, tobacco company website in China. This is an event sponsored by the industry targeted at youth. This is a uh, parkour event, so the kids jumping off tables and all sorts of crazy things. And again, this is still happening today. This, it's debatable if it has been banned or not. A lot of the times it depends on where the event is happening and on uh, the tobacco industry's holds on the local government. So this photo, I don't know if you've seen it around the media. I think it's one of the infamous photos of the Chinese industry, and I think it's a good representation of all three uh, kind of, the, a, a good way to illustrate agency power, right? So this is political power because this is a school building, and um, it's sponsored by the tobacco industry. You can see the logo right there. That's their leaf logo that actually says China Tobacco. The slogan, here says, genius is from hard work, tobacco helps you excel. This is actually part of the government's um, Project HOPE, which is a government project targeted at rural development. So around the country, there are many, many uh, Project HOPE elementary schools being built. Sometimes they're also called HOPE elementary schools. Well, tobacco industry, because it's part of the government, it's able to engage and become part of those projects directly. That's political power right there. They have financial power, therefore they, can, they have all the money to donate uh, a school building. Up to right now, it's very hard to say how many of these projects or how many of these buildings exist, but uh, it's believed that there are over 100 across the country. 
And um, some of my colleagues in China, they actually went to uh, one of the villages where these schools exist, and they talked to some of the people. So these are quotes that they got from those kids, right? The common theme is that, well, this is a poor area. We previously were studying, you know, under trees in a building that was falling apart. And the tobacco industry, because they're so kind, and they came in, built this new shiny building for us, and now we have proper tables, we have proper desks, and we even have computers. This is a rural area in the mountains. So, um, and it's also a major tobacco leaf growing area. So for these children, the fact, you know, the slogan, tobacco helps you excel, it's not as horrifying as it may seem to us because to them, it's actually the reality. And what I found terrifying in a way <coughs> is that the same perception was coming out from parents, teachers, the school administrators, and even the officials, local officials. Um, this is my favorite. Smoking is bad, but money is money. That also illustrates that how much financial power the industry has. The government may not have the money to build the school, right? But the industry does. Therefore, this is what they're doing. It's a way to promote themselves in this tobacco growing community. It's a way to sway public opinion. And it's just a good way to promote themselves. They have their logo on the school building. I mean, to me, that's marketing, right? Um, so this is the reality in China today. There has been some work uh, targeting these kind of schools, but again, implementation depends on where you're trying to target the, uh, these activities. If it's in a place where tobacco doesn't have very big economic importance, then the government will, will be more likely to do something. But in a region that's heavily dependent on tobacco, they don't have any incentives to do that. So this is all within China. But this is why it's a problem to the global community. The central government has something that's called global, Go Global Strategy. It's also sometimes translated as Going Out Strategy, but I think this one sounds better, so I'm going with this one. Um, it was a key government strategy adopted in 2000, and it was aimed at shifting the Chinese economic model that was previously very export-based, and where China was the world's factory, basically, to one that would shift to brand development. So the Chinese government wanted China to have its own brands that could compete on the market with its international counterparts. Specifically, the, the industry adopted the Go Global strategy in 2003, and they wanted to operate, implement it by what they called adopting a big tobacco strategy. That includes market expansion, that includes establishing offshore production facilities, and diversifying into non-tobacco industries. Now, in 2013, the Belt and Road Initiative was adopted as a uh, development strategy. I would think of this as Go Global 2.0. Here's a map again. So the red part is the belt. It links China's far west with Central Asia, Middle East, and eventually ends up in Europe. The road part of this uh, initiative is what's called the Maritime Silk Road, hence the road. Again, it links China's coastal region with Southeast Asia, India, East Africa, and also eventually ends up in Europe. This initiative links about 80 countries, which between them account for two thirds of the global population. Now, the strategy, even though it's been uh, it's been a few years now since it's been announced, but it still remains pretty vague. However, we believe that um, it, there are three focus areas. Number one, infrastructure. So for the belt part on land, this means rails and road. And for the road part, the Maritime Silk Road, 
This includes ports and uh, rail systems. The other focus areas is trade. So China is uh, entering into trade agreements with the ver various countries along the belt and road. And a third is, I guess, soft power. So culture, cultural exchange, education, scholarship programs, etc. Now, this has relevance to the tobacco industry as well. The tobacco industry hopes to expand into markets of BRI countries. In their words, these are relatively undeveloped markets, meaning that they have not yet been taken over by the transnationals. So they think this, they see it as space where CNT, that CNTC can fill. And these markets together account for 54.1% of the global tobacco sales outside of China. So there's a lot of space where they can maneuver. They expect Chinese brands to be introduced by two ways. So because BRI focuses on infrastructure development, it is expected that these will bring some Chinese workers to these countries. And Chinese workers will be more familiar with Chinese brands. They, those are the brands they would prefer to smoke as compared to international brands. So they expect the Chinese workers to introduce the locals to the great Chinese brands this way. And the second is Chinese tourists, which are, would be part of the, tourism would be part of the um, cultural part of BRI. And it's, it's expected that, well, some of the Chinese tourists would be smokers who would also bring their family brands with them while, when they go traveling. The industry aims for targeted product development in these countries. So they are doing their homework. They are studying what the local population prefers in terms of tastes and uh, blends. And they are also actively seeking local investment partners to expand into these markets rather than just export. So when we started looking at um, the Chinese tobacco industry, we wanted to have a clear framework so we knew what we were looking at. So we had three main questions we wanted to answer. Number one, why are they globalizing? Number two, how are they globalizing? And number three, how globalized are they to date? And, and I'll go over each of these uh, later on. So first, there are three main factors why CNTC wanted to globalize. The first one is China accessed the World Trade Organization in 2001, and the industry was um, anticipating that this would mean China had to lift some of its non-economic, non sorry, non-tariff trade barriers, which would allow for the international brands to come in, which means potential market erosion by, uh, by these brands. Secondly, WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control was ratified in 2000, 2005 and came into effect in 2006. And the industry was anticipating um, lower smoking rates as part of that. And lastly, even though the Chinese uh, China as a country has many, many smokers, 350 million, the market was still becoming pretty saturated. So in terms of CNTC, it has four goals when it's uh, seeking global expansion. Number one is a re natural resource seeker. So it seeks better quality raw products, in this case, leaf. Number two, it's seeking new markets to expand to. Thirdly, it's also an efficiency seeker because it makes far more sense to have an offshore production facility um, than just export from one country around the world. And lastly, it's also seeking uh, assets. So it's actively seeking opportunities to merge or buy up any of the local smaller tobacco companies that may exist in various countries. Domestically, they did some uh, very active restructuring of the industry to prepare for globalization. Because this is such a um, profitable industry, every province has its own factories. 
and this made for a very crowded landscape. In 1998, um, there were 185 factories, which the industry, which the, the government then called on to consolidate. So they separated these factories into four categories. The poorly performing factories were all closed. The smaller factories were merged to become bigger. The medium-sized factories were either merged within themselves or they were merged with, a bigger, with the smaller factories become a bigger company. And the largest companies where um, they had all these uh, kind of supported, support from the government to become even bigger. So in 2009, this means that the, comp the, the number of factories went down to only 31. Another um, strategy was aimed at products. Again, because there were so many factories each producing their own brands, there were a lot of brands at one point. In 1990s, there were over 2,000 brands being produced around China. This is a big problem if you want to develop a flagship brand, because if you have so many choices to pick from, then you're never going to be loyal to this one brand. So because the companies, the, the factories were closed down, some of the brands were also eliminated, and by 2013, there were only 90 brands remaining in China. However, brand consolidation also took place on the international market. So in um, 2013, there were 71 Chinese brands being exported or being produced overseas. In 2013, there were only 30. Another uh, brand-related uh, strategy is premiumization. This is both for profit and so that uh, also for a quality perception. So the industry eventually wanted to have a brand that would be, a Chinese brand that would be comparable with Marlboros or Camels in terms of quality and price. Here is an example. Um, this brand is called Angkor. It's developed by a Chinese subsidiary in Cambodia. And this is the only locally developed premium brand. The other premium brands being sold in Cambodia are by British American Tobacco. And the photo on the right-hand side is a Chinese brand that's being marketed on duty-free markets around the world. It's also uh, one of the more, more expensive brands. China tobacco has been exporting since the 80s. The earliest data I could get my hands on are from 1992. So this is why the graph only starts in 1992. Um, I am not sure why the value of exports peaked in 1995. But what I can say is the low, the bottom in 1990, corresponds with the time when the industry was being restructured domestically. So this is when they were uh, closing down factories, when they were eliminating brands. However, the value, export value, has been increasing slowly since then. And 2008 is a milestone, is what I think is a milestone. That is the year when all of China's over offshore facilities were centralized under China Tobacco International. There's Tiba Japan Tobacco International, now there's China Tobacco International. So they are based in Europe, and they are supposed to act as the parent company of all of CNTC's offshore uh, ventures. To globalize, CNTC, especially back in the 80s, they were this unsophisticated uh, state-owned enterprise. And in order for them to become more profitable, they needed to learn the skills, the technical know-how from the more sophisticated transnational companies. Step one, license production. In 1983, R.G. Reynolds licensed the production of its camel cigarettes to Shaman Tobacco Factory. And once they had all the technological know-how, step two was for 
joint brand development. Again, R.J. Reynolds, Shaman Tobacco Cigarette Factory, produced this brand, uh, jointly developed brand, is called Golden Bridge in 1989. And it was quite successful at one point. Third step, joint ventures. In 2005, uh, an equity joint venture was announced between China Tobacco and Philip Morris International. The company was called CTPMI. It's based in Switzerland, and it, the company has um, distribution rights of Marlboro in China, but in exchange, they had to distribute three Chinese brands using their distribution networks overseas. Distribution has been one of the bottlenecks for the Chinese industry overseas, so this way they were able to piggyback on a very established existing distribution network. In 2013, a new company was formed. It's called CTBAT. I, don't, I think it's pretty obvious who the second partner is. They are based in Hong Kong, and they have worldwide distribution brands to State Express 555, as well as distribution brands to a Chinese brand called Double Happiness outside of China. Um, in 2017, a third company came up. Uh, it's called Global Horizon Ventures. It's, again, a, an equity joint venture between China Tobacco and Imperial Brands. They market um, Imperials Davidoff and West in China, and um, overseas they market uh, Jade and one other brand I cannot remember right now. So that's PMI, BAT, Imperial. That's three of the four transnational companies. I wouldn't be surprised if there is a joint venture formed with JTI down the road. However, the story with JTI is interesting because CNTC has licensed production of its brands to JTI for production and distribution in Russia. So you see they went from the receiving end of licensed production to the other end in a span of 30, 40 years. I think that's a pretty remarkable growth story for a company, but it's also terrifying because of the product they produce. Again, we're back to this map uh, I showed earlier. So this shows um, all of CNTC's offshore facilities. That includes production factories, that includes distribution offices, as well as leaf procurement companies. Um, most of the companies are in Southeast Asia, and CNTC has a longer history of engagement in Southeast Asia. Uh, just because it's right next door. However, they are really expanding their global reach, and there are companies now on every single continent apart from Australia. Here in the States, it's called CTI, China, National, sorry, China Tobacco International, North America. The company is based in North Carolina, so next door. They are buying American leaf. In Mexico, there is a distribution office which has plans to eventually produce um, Chinese brands for markets, neighbor markets. So that's Central and presumably uh, South America. Now, CNTC has also taken first step to publicly list its company. In January this year, China Tobacco International Hong Kong was listed on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. This is a company that is responsible for leaf procurement and duty-free sales globally. It aims to invest the money generated from public listing into market expansion and marketing campaigns. So this is step one to go public. It's not clear if any of its other overseas companies would be listed eventually, but this is what's happened so far. So how, is, how globalized is CNTC? Well, I think all those are very strong indicators that are, they are ready to become a major international player if they're not yet there. They have restructured their industry domestically and overseas, and they have consolidated. 
to become more efficient and uh, for greater economies of scale. They are also engaging in market-specific product development. And so like that um, Cambodian brand we saw earlier, it was specifically developed for the Cambodian market based on their taste preferences. China is also now targeting a diversified range of markets. They're exporting everywhere. And the offshore operations, again, are in a range of geographical areas. And they are increasingly cooperating with the transnational companies, as well as a lot of their activities and behavior is increasingly like those of TTCs. Why does this matter and what does this mean? The tobacco industry worldwide is very consolidated. So when you have a new player the size of China come in, it's going to disrupt the market. They will bring new products, which means there will be a competition in terms of price, um, and there's also going to be more intensified marketing because everybody, well, the, the, the companies will want consumers to stick to their products. Because of the increased um, demand, it's, it's anticipated that there will be an increase in demand on raw products, which means that tobacco farmers, particularly in major leaf growing countries around the world, will be impacted. I'll, talk, I'll come back to these um, implications. I'll talk about each one of them with a case study. So new products. This is a graph showing trade, cigarette trade between China and Panama. Tiny, tiny country. So the blue shows the trade, the import value of Panama from China between, um, can't even see, 1995 and 2016. And the red shows China's export value of cigarettes to Panama. Logically, the lines should overlap, but they don't. So what is happening in this gap right here? It was never recorded by Panama. It could be that the data was not recorded, or it could also be that this was illicit trade or contraband cigarettes. The interesting thing about Panama is that it, as an export destination of Chinese cigarettes, it grew rapidly. It was actually number two in 2016 after Hong Kong. It's a tiny country. Why do they need so many cigarettes from China? And 95% of Chinese goods exported to Panama are shipped to clone-free trade zone including cigarettes. Specifically in Panama, there's a company called Overseas United. This is China Tobacco's Latin American production base, which was formed in 2012, and they are based in Cologne Free Trade Zone. Initially, they had an annual production capacity of 2.4 billion sticks, which, uh, and they had plans to increase that to four to five billion. They produce a range of brands, uh, such as Silver Elephant, Marshall, and Modern. And all these brands, or these brands, are reportedly illegally sold on markets in Colombia, Costa Rica, Honduras, Mexico, and a range of other countries. So these products pop up in those countries without the proper paperwork. The company, Overseas United, was investigated in September 2015, and they were eventually forced to shut down in April 2016. Interestingly enough, um, there's far more media reports about this outside of China than in China. Uh, and the company says they do have plans to reopen, but it has not yet happened. This, um, now Uruguay, this slide is actually uh, was a contribution from my colleague. This is a company that has been, that is based in Uruguay and has been quietly producing Chinese cigarettes for local market and for export for two years before it was revealed in the media after a complaint to the Ministry of Labor. 
There were numerous irregularities about this company in terms of salaries and working hours. And it's suspected that this company has been producing um, products for contraband, contraband products. Another case is Malawi. This is a photo we took in November last year. I was in Malawi for two weeks with a colleague um, interviewing some people on the Chinese tobacco's involvement locally. The interesting case about Malawi is that um, even though from China tobacco, there was interest in the country to import their leaf, but that didn't really happen. And although there are Chinese, or there are Chinese uh, cigarette factories, two Chinese cigarette factories in Malawi, on paper, and officially, they are not associated with CNTC. So these are two local tobacco companies that were set up by Chinese nationals. So if you look at this photo, um, the top, the white is a BAT brand, and then the, um, these two are by another local manufacturer owned by a group of Greek people. Everything else are brands by the two tobacco companies owned by Chinese nationals, producing locally in Malawi. So this is already um, an increase in new products available to locals. And Malawi doesn't even have many smokers. In terms of price, they are comparable to the BAT brands. And of course, there are some um, economy segments, more or cheaper brands uh, sold by these two companies. On to tobacco farming. CNTC has offshore companies specifically engaged in leaf procurement and farming in Argentina, Brazil, United States, and Zimbabwe. All four are major leaf producing companies. In Zimbabwe, the case is um, inter interesting because of geopolitical situation. So after Robert Mugabe implemented the very controversial land reforms, the Western countries imposed various economic sanctions. And he was forced to look the other way, look east. And they adopted the look east policy in 2003. This means that China was able to come in as a major investor. Uh, Zimbabwe as a country is the largest producer of Virginia leaf, which is the leaf that is predominantly smoked um, in Chinese brands. The rest of the world smokes burly tobacco, but Chinese uh, smokers smoke Virginia blend. And um, the quality of leaf produced in Zimbabwe is known as, it's, it's said to be the best quality, it's known as the golden leaf. And exports to China have increased steadily. And China is actually now the major exporter of leaf from Zimbabwe. This was done by CNTC's subsidiary in Zimbabwe called Tianzi Tobacco Company. It was launched in 2005, and it sources leaf from Zimbabwe as well as from neighboring countries. They employ about 160 locals with only a handful of uh, Chinese nationals running the company, and they are credited with reviving the dying Zimbabwean uh, tobacco industry. They are reportedly responsible for creating over 20,000 jobs. And this company buys leaf both from auction floors, so this is where um, leaf is being sold, like it's a big building where farmers bring their leaf to sell. And they also engage in contract farming, so they will go to a farmer, provide all the inputs, so fertilizer, equipment, sometimes they will teach them how to grow better quality leaf, how to, um, increase production yields, and in return, the farmers will sign a contract to say that, you know, at the end of the growing season, we will sell our leaf to your company for X amount of money. Tianzi Tobacco Company is said to be offering higher prices than average. So they offer $3.36 per kilogram compared to $2.84.
Remember this photo I showed earlier? That was in China in the rural area. This is Zimbabwe. I don't know if you can see, but on the red banner that says China Tobacco Hope Primary School. This is in Zimbabwe. So the exact same type of corporate social responsibility projects, uh, projects now exported overseas in Zimbabwe. And this is what's being said about it in the media. So the school children were previously learning under trees. Now they have this shiny building. I'm assuming the Chinese guy in the middle here is the director of the company. And he actually said, well, apart from this school, we also support local orphanages. We provide school supplies. We provide them with food baskets. We also pay tuition for gifted students so they can receive education. Why? Because children are the future. Which is ironic, because the company is a leaf-buying company, and tobacco farming is known to have a very big issue um, around child labor. On the one hand, you know, his company is profiting money from growing leaf, which, which are often um, done by the children. On the other hand, they also support these children. Back to Malawi. Um, historically, they had diplomatic relations with Taiwan. However, they cut all those dip diplomatic ties and uh, established diplomatic ties with China in 2008. And tobacco, because it's such an important agricultural crop in Malawi, it was actually included in the memorandum of understanding signed between the two governments. So China had committed to support agricultural development in Malawi. And specifically, they included tobacco, uh, corn, and cotton. Those are the three main crops in Malawi. Malawi is one of the poorest countries in the world. It's one of the least developed countries. It's also the most tobacco-dependent country in the world. And tobacco leaf contributes to 60% of foreign exchange earnings for the government. We spent two weeks in Malawi talking to various people about um, Chinese engagement locally and if they had seen a change since the Chinese came in 10 years ago. Um, but you know, as you can see on the graph here, oops, as you can see on the graph here, exports to China have not really gone up. We're not really sure why, but um, it could be that Malawi has stronger ties with the traditional leaf growing companies, you know, um, Alliance One or Universal. And uh, they also grow the different type of leaf that China wants. And the quality was also not as good as from Zimbabwe. So it was hoped that because China was supposed to support LEAF, it was hoped that a similar story as in Zimbabwe would unfold and the livelihoods of farmers would improve. However, LEAF prices actually fell down. We're not sure why, but um, you know, one of the, uh, we had a few um, participants say that the, what was hoped would happen with Chinese involvement was actually not realized at all. So what happens now? Well, I think as a step one, people in the tobacco control community, especially those focusing on industry behavior, need to realize how big of a player CNTC is. And if there's any meaningful work to be done around tobacco control, they need to be included as well. It's no longer sufficient to just look at the strategies of British American Tobacco or Philip Morris International because China Tobacco has been allowed to stay under the radar for far too long and they've grown much bigger than anybody previously suspected. And with that, well, we need more research and more research funding. Domestically in China, there's 
very little funding for tobacco control research, and most of that focuses on smokers, smoking behavior, et cetera. There's nobody look, looking at industry behavior. I don't know if this is because there is no funding or if this is because a politically sensitive issue, probably a little bit of both. And I want to conclude by saying that this is really a team effort and um, I want to acknowledge some of, the, some of my colleagues who are not here today. Um, Kelly Lee is my PI and she developed the globalization framework along with uh, Yep Eckhart and um, Julia Smith, who's the PI on the Shirk Fund grant that sent us on a two-week adventure to Malawi. Um, also, Lauren D'Souza, who is our research uh, assistant who helped with some very useful desktop review, specifically looking at the African countries. And a, our uh, research associate, Benoit Gomi, who leads illicit trade research. And also our funders, the NH and SHRC, so Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada. And thank you all for coming. I hope that wasn't too boring. And here's some uh, information if you want to get hold of us or learn more about our work. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for your presentation here. And I have a question. You do a lot of uh, research about the um, China tobacco, tobacco tree. And, and I want to ask you, do you do any other um, research about uh, uh, what we should do and what we can do to weaken the influence of China tobacco? Because that's the... Uh, um, that's the... Uh, that's the point that we, global tobacco control community, um, wanted to do to, to minimize the influence of China tobacco. Do you have do that research? That's a very difficult question, and uh, the short answer is no. I haven't done any research on that. Um, I think in terms of diminishing the power, well, it's kind of hard because it is part of the government. And it is a major revenue generator for the government. So unless there's a way to, for the government to find the 7% in revenue elsewhere, I don't think it's going to be on their priority list of things to do. Um, right now, there is a uh, healthy China, uh, vision, healthy China 2030, and smoking is included in that. So maybe something will happen in terms of tobacco control, but I, I, I just my guess, it's going to be probably more tar targeted at the individual smoker instead of the top level um, targeting the industry. Hi, thanks for a great talk. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, has uh, CNTC, it's CNTC, mm -hmm. TC, uh, um, have they come across any of your research or has anyone from China? Um, and do you anticipate it getting a little bit harder to do this research as more of it's out in the public domain? You know, I haven't, uh, so this research was done on China, outside of China. I don't know what the situation is going to look like if I were to do this research in China. I'm not sure uh, if CNTC or anybody in the industry keeps track of the research about them outside of China. I'd rather not know at this point. <laughs> um, I'm wondering if you could um, say a little bit more about uh, China Tobacco International and its incorporation. You mentioned in 2008 there was an incorporation and they are somewhere in Europe. Could, could you share a little bit more about that? Yeah, so before it was, um, there were kind of the overseas subsidiary, subsidiary of China Tobacco. And they were, I guess, more of a manage, management entity. And in 2008, um, they restructured, so the name became China Tobacco International. Before it was with this very long name, something like China Tobacco Import Export Group, something, something. Very long name, very long acronym. 
they get, became China Tobacco International, and they're supposed to um, kind of act as, as the parent company of all of China Tobacco's overseas operations. How, if and how that has been turned into practice, I cannot say. Um, their website stopped working, basically. So <laughs> there's, yeah, no way to obtain that information. Yes. Well, Jennifer, thank you so much for educating us on this very important topic. I have to say, personally, it's very scary of what might be um, in the future. But the first step is to study it and to understand what's happening. So thank you so much for a terrific talk. Really appreciate thank you. it.